I want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, I know I've got friends out in the audience. I know that I have buddies that uh, I get up in the morning with and toss uh, concrete blocks and uh, cabers around with. Uh, I've got some family in here and I've got folks that I don't know. Um, but I really appreciate you coming here in, in celebration of my book and in celebration of LSU Press, whom uh, I'm so thankful for and for Sonny Rosen, who has put this on and has shown me the ways, uh, her grand poobah ways of being on uh, Facebook Live. So I hope that I am doing well there. I've got a Shelly Cato painting uh, behind me that she, she painted for me. So uh, cheers to Shelly. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Adam Vines. I'm an associate professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'm editor of Birmingham Poetry Review. And uh, I've been a lifelong resident of Birmingham, except for a few years when I went away for graduate school. Um, I'm a lifelong fisher person. Uh, I've been tromping through creeks and uh, running trot lines and limb lines and fishing for bass uh, my whole life. And then even for graduate school, I went off to uh, University of Florida because of its close proximity to water as much as anything. So I did my research. Uh, on either coast. And that's what was great about Gainesville. I could go to either coast. Um, I say that because the, the collection that I'm going to read from today is entitled Lures. Uh, many, of the, many of the poems in this collection are related to fishing. However, like all poems that have subject matters, I'd like to think that there's some greater truth embedded there. Uh, and that the metaphor of luring and being lured is always present in the poems. Uh, I have poems about fatherhood, I have quite a few elegiac poems, uh, I have poems about my daughter. So I'm going to start off reading some poems about my daughter because she is probably on her way to gymnastics right now. And I would imagine that she's listening. I hope if Melissa has me on the phone. Um, Mary, when, I, when she became old enough to realize that her daddy was a silly poet, uh, she said, Daddy, I want you to write poems about me. And I said, honey, I do write poems about you. She said, do you read those poems when you go off and read? And I said, yes, I read those poems. And she said, no, are all the poems about me? And do you read only poems about me when you go off? And I said, no, I don't have enough poems. And she said, you need to get on to that. So I've gotten on that and I've got a few more poems about Mary. So I thought I'd read a few poems about Mary and then read some uh, poems that are about fishing and Sadly, friends that I've lost and tributes to them. This first poem is about uh, watching my daughter when she was uh, learning how to be an acolyte and watching her walk down the aisle of the church for the first time. Prayer for the new acolyte for Mary. Settle my daughter's feet and clenching toes before the organ's prelude. Lead her doe's gait, soft measured, as if on leaves instead of stone. Lighten her kata, the sleeves unfed like open mouths, her hands dry tongues, and tame her arms outstretched with wonder and the flame. Give her the grace to light the wick, then walk away and sit through creeds, the silent stalk of prayers, the sermon's knife and recompense. And in the preacher's final words, our stench of sins, the benediction threatens to relieve, bestow her strength to snuff the flame and still believe. Next poem is This Little Piggy for Mary. Like a cat lured by its tail, my daughter doesn't yet know her feet are hers. She chews and slobbers on these strange orphans, slaps them together as a punished student would chalkboard erasers. In her crib, hands clasp feet in a spire of unstable flesh. Then she plops to one side, looks at me, then doesn't, through the bars as I kneel. And I see clearly that the red in my beard is the red in her curls, but also that my daughter is not mine. 
that love is not possession or a mere pronoun or an apostrophe in the sympathetic system of language, that one day she will realize that her feet conform to her will, her heart, and she will walk away from them. This next poem is a triolet. I've been playing with this form for a while now. Uh, it's 11th, 12th century French form. It's usually humorous. It started out as being a, a funny poem. Think of it as kind of a French limerick, but a little longer, eight lines. And it has these strict uh, repetitions and rhyming patterns. Um, but I've been trying to take on serious subjects with the triolet. I've, uh, I play with form quite a bit in this collection, modified forms and uh, received forms and Knox forms. Tea party for Mary. My daughter is sick again, but she still asks for tea times, her great aunt's cups, the empty tin. My daughter is sick again. She says I need to choke again. I hold her hair like flower stems. My daughter is sick again but she still asks for tea times. Mary used to wake up in the morning and when I would go in to see her before it was light, she would wake up with these questions. She was such a precocious kid and still is at 14. Um, but this was a question that she asked one afternoon. Uh, Melissa was off uh, at dance and uh, we were eating dinner and uh, of course I made a bowl of beans, uh, my Neanderthal self. Uh, and uh, we were both eating beans at the table and she had a question to ask me. Question from a bowl of beans for Mary. A bite of beans, a long milk draw, and then a side glance. What's it like to be a boy, she asked. Tiresias first came to mind the mating snakes he stuck he struck the female dead, his seven years in women's flesh that followed, didacticism at its worst, I thought, especially how to explain his lie to Hera, pleasures of the we and woo and homosocial bonds, the kind of myth an eight-year-old like mine would dig, then dig at me until I broke, explaining different parts in dumbass boys, the birds and bees. My wife was teaching dance that night and would have struck me blind if I had gone that way. Instead, I merely said, it ain't that bad. A lie, of course, then took another bite of beans. The penis seems to be a lot of trouble, she said while looking down into her bowl. And once again, I thought deflect. I could bring Nana into play and how at eight, I told my class about my front tail and zipped my pants to show them when they said I lied. Miss Walker screamed the long walk down the hall. How Nana let me think I had a tail for years until that day when I walked home and Daddy told me about the penis, the stiff-tailed ways. I knew it ain't that bad would hardly do for this. I said, you're right. It is a lot of trouble. Stay away. I guess I'm still saying that too. This is a question that she had early one morning when she woke up. And it was after we had watched uh, the, women mar the Women's March Across America uh, the night before and talked to her about what was happening. For Mary, morning question in bed after the Women's Marches Across America. Do we deserve to live, you ask? Not do we live or how we live, those I have stumbled through before. Dawn reticulating light through blinds across the beds I built for your dolls. Before I trip into an answer, some softened hume or backwoods job, or try to squeeze from you the doubt, you blurt out Pilate's wife, the dream she had, what you recall from Sunday service. You say that you woke up last night from dreams of women dressed in white while standing in the streets. And as the light reveals your face, a bar across your mouth and one across your eyes, your words dissolve, reform into a wrinkled sheet of light I lift above my head to hear and see beneath three million chant in unison, our bodies are not ours, our bodies are not yours. You ask, 
what is our only comfort in. I can't respond. I hide my face. And us, you say for me, with fortitude and grace. All right, I'm going to read uh, Smell a Jag Poems. Um, this is a book that I tried to write 25 years ago, but I, I wasn't ready to take the uh, confessional eye yet. It may have been because I was in my mid 20s and I just first started writing. I didn't really have the the gumption or the know-how to um, take that voice and to um, to enter into some of the, the despair and the loss um, of losing my father. So uh, I wrote poems for a while and uh, probably two or three years ago, I started going through them and realized that I was starting to embrace um, the more autobiographical eye instead of the persona that I tend to hide behind. My father's rod fishing the skinny moon in memory of Van Allen Vines. While waiting on the Opelousa bite where channel cats would do, our fingertips plucking our fishing lines below the first eyes, twitching livers we had hooked and cast into the river's crawl, my father would relax, the only time I witnessed this. He'd stretch his legs and dig his heels and match a lucky strike to life. He'd drag and exhale that the night had pocketed the moon. The cats would bite, we'd be all right. I'd dig in deep like him and hum a, and hum a hymn I still don't know the name of, nor did he, I don't believe. But in that dark, that settling loam and that Alabama clay, that him was ours and God was there or not, it didn't matter. The bills were paid. He held his rod, he'd be all right. Tell me a story. Father, tell me about the moor who moored his boat in a moor how he ate petrified alligator toes and hid his prayers in snail shells, how he turned into a bear, refused to hunt, spent his days licking the shadows of crows that stretched before him. Brother, tell me the one about the woman who planted her husband's pool cue in the ochre loam of her childhood creek, the smooth ash nodding into dogwood, the blue tips sobering blooms. Tell me about the woman at the dump, her eyes large and dark as a mule's, how she enters our dreams when she gathers our junk. Mother, tell me about the bricklayer who was taken away to rebuild the city of God, how he didn't need a plumb line to lay the golden courses, how his trowel turned into a crappie when he was done. But this time, let me finish. His son mixed what he had learned in Sunday school and comic books to try to make sense of it all. Wished he were Thor, winged crown of tinfoil on his head, his father's brick hammer dangling from a belt loop. How he descended into the underworld of the basement to find, the, to find his father after the burning bush was just burning brush and the rainbow bridge was merely the long frown of the morning storm. This is River Elegy. This is an elegy that I wrote for uh, Jake Adam York, who's also a Alabama boy like me and sadly had a stroke about seven or eight years ago. I was in New York doing research for my last book and uh, it was the first time I had been there on my own. I'd never called a taxi on my own. I'd never, I, I was alone in a big city and uh, couldn't find my way around. And while I was there, um, I started to get my, my feet down. I, I went to Museum Mile and spent about 10 days there. But toward the end of the trip, um, I heard that Jake had had a stroke and was in really bad shape. And uh, he was supposed to come to Birmingham that next month for a reading. We had always um, threatened to see each other, uh, but never really got to. Um, we admired each other's work and would write back and forth and talked about getting together and 
drinking whiskey and talking about blues and doing some trot lining. And uh, sadly, he died before we were able to do that. River Elegy. In the beginning of this poem, um, you know, in Alabama, when it snows, everybody goes nuts and clears out the, uh, the uh, grocery stores of milk and bread. And there's two terms in here. Uh, black snake is, uh, is a term that old timer coal miners use for uh, train cars. And uh, a hogger is a train conductor. River Elegy in memory of Jake Adam York. Yesterday, snow, not stars, fell on Alabama. But on my slow jam home over Red Mountain, behind a streak of red and bulk stocked cars, chalked by a field of white, I can't keep from humming the tune over and over, replacing stars with snow. Tomorrow I would have driven past Tuxedo Junction where Erskine Hawkins might have brassed those stars 75 years ago in Ensley and over viaducts beneath which hoggers haven't hung rails with black snakes or pig iron cars in decades and foundry molds haven't flushed orange for just as long and on to the sticks through hollers where my kin ripped seams of coal and piled spoils in rippling rows, healing pulp pines in their stead. And on to beat 10 of the Warrior River, where fish camps outnumber churches, where a man stepping on another man's land might see a lightning still hunkered into a bank, or just how deep that river channel is. And on to the dirt road's end, where my kin crawled out of the river, where I would have cut and split a seasoned turkey oak for your visit, and piled rocks for a pit closer to the slough. So when we would have run and relivered that trot line by the skinny moon, we'd have fire close when we sculled back to the bank. Then over a skillet of skeeting yellow cat fillets, I would have mentioned the rendition still stuck in my head even today, Fitzgerald and Armstrong's and the absurd snow. And you would have gone on about you an Alabama privet switch driving through Colorado on winter days. And I bet I would have learned from you on that night that will never be what I had to learn on my own today. That Holiday and Coltrane flirted through that number two and the song owes its breath to the 1833 Leonid's meteor shower, the night the stars fell. And I imagine you would have said what I am thinking now that a shower of 33 happens only once every couple of lifetimes. And even then it won't happen if you ain't paying attention. This is the uh, title poem, Lures. Um, it's uh, in memory of my closest friend and fishing partner of 42 years who sadly passed of a glioblastoma about seven years ago now. Lures in memory of Scott Harris. Last summer's fishing failures dangled from trees. Arapala and jitterbug, a stand a privet paid for. Half ounce jigs with rubber skirts and jelly worms with wide gap hooks on 10 pound tests. We tithed with overzealous casts at bass. Then off we'd go, our stringers bare, to find a yard to cut, a truck to wash, so we could fill the tackle box we shared again. Today is 12, 12, 12, the Mayan end, and I, a country boy in Brooklyn for the week, will hail a gap, cab for the first time and think of cows unnerved by fish we missed and shouts of shit that followed and dawns to dusks and always back with you, my childhood friend. Our girls will never know that pond's deep hole a baseball diamond now fills the city leader's bright idea, or how their father sitting in the bleachers on Saturdays a couple decades later can almost feel the stinging nettle against their thighs, the, lunky, the lunker largemouth sweeping the bed with her tail while plastic lizards jerk and drag across the third base line. Or how when we untrain our ears to baseball's cracking bats and bitchy parents called strikes and alike. We hear the peepers sounding off in oaks on down the way, 
our mothers and fathers' voices calling us home, not too far behind or ahead. Or ahead. I just noticed in this poem, in the, the last poem I read, because maybe I've never read them uh, one right after the other, that you know, in, in trying to secure your autobiography, sometimes you can ruin a poem. And uh, you know, I have biographical elements or autobiographical elements in all of these poems, but but many of them I have to write what's best for the poem and not what's best for securing the autobiography. So it, I, I'm just seeing now how these two events and these two elegies kind of blended into one another, um, where parts of what what happened in reality. I get placed in one poem over the other. The drought. The hostas lip their purple sex despite their curling leaves, today more brown than green, and trillium are gone, their shriveled stems tar black. Even the poison oak falls limp from trunks. The sugar maples drop their yellow skirts on the yellow lawn, and the yellow lab across the street unhinges his spine. Dirt angels, nose to ass and back again, again, again. The rising dust, his futile pleasure's ghost. And inside you wait for me. Your temp is right, the sheets pulled back. My pillow fluffed while low Sinatra croons, a garden in the rain. I'm gonna read a couple of more. Forcing the joints. And I said that this was a book that I tried to write, you know, 25 years ago or, or longer. Um, this poem was probably one of the first uh, attempts that I had of, of writing about um, my patra lineage and uh, uh, our history on the, the Warrior River. Um, I probably went through, well, I know I did, I went through over 80 drafts of this poem over 25 years, and it wasn't until I was at a writing residency at Rivendell, and I went into a cave and started feeling around on the limestone when it got dark. And it reminded me of something about uh, my grandfather's cabin that he had built and that had been torched by some hunters. And I was finally able to write this poem. Uh, but it wasn't until I went back to Rivendell, uh, tore up my revisions that I had, I deleted all of the files and started from scratch. Um, and then that week, somehow it started to come together. Um, it fell in and out of form. Uh, there's two stanzas in here that are Spencerian stanzas, and then there's two stanzas that are um, blank verse. Coursing the joints. While setting trots and drops for channel cats on the river where my family spawned, I sculled the bank around the bend and past the camps where city folks launched boats with colors culled from candy stores and tourist traps. The lulled, my gramps would say in his last years, when wakes from outboards nearly swamped his john and bowled him to the bank. I pulled him to the slough where he would mash his shine and take a nip or ten and lose himself in jars. The cabin that he built five decades back from rock he'd hauled and sand he'd scraped from roads, the mortar pink from clay was torched. Some hunters I ran off the month before were running dogs for deer and said, the land ain't yours. I walked them to the boundary line, a pistol at their backs. We'll get you, pussy boy, they said. Some empty bud cans have been tossed beside a white oak where we nailed and skinned our cats. The cabin was now just a shell, a porch of river rocks, a couple walls of shale, the chimney still intact. Inside a scorched bed frame, a deformed stove and fridge, the rails that held a whittled pistol grip to our hailed 410 named Garby gone lay on the hearth beside the lock and barrel. The rest was veiled with ash and char, and I could see the mortar lips, the inside walls once concealed, where he had jugged with fingertips 
and squish the mud between the upturned rocks where trowels just couldn't fit or when he tipped the shine while mixing mud and laying rock. I pressed my knuckles into his, my thumb, my palm, and bent a brick tie back and forth until it snapped. I ran my hands across the joints from course to course, my fingers spreading out and snaking through his hands, the fossils he had left behind, the gift the fire gave back to me. The lesson I learned over those 25 years and in that final draft was that I had to, um, I had to forgive these people who torched my grandfather's cabin. It was this manifestation of, you know, my memories of my father and uh, my grandfather who had both died a couple of years earlier within six or eight months of each other. Um, and there was a blessing there. Once the, uh, the fire had taken all the wood and the insides were left, I could see, you know, those fingerprints where he had pushed in that mortar into the rocks um, where he built that cabin by hand. And in that way, I was able to reconnect with my grandfather. All right, this will be the last poem. Last day of Brinkwood. To become aware of the possibility of the search is to be on to something, Walker Percy. A peony busts through the mulch, its leaves drooping and purple veined, the stem the same. Hard freeze tonight. The bud won't burst its frame this year, and clench the red and white it weaves. This one, the first this spring, the periscope. What spiked this bulb and coaxed it through the soil, like the second coming, the uncoiling of arms, the end of days when we will lope for one last time on earth and bathe in fire and burn in lakes. Lost Cove is spooming with desire below. The frothy streams, the squirrels in rut, a yelping hen, a tom's vibrato, sal saltatory strut. This early bulb will wait another year to let loose what it sucks back in tonight, the coming on, we fear. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll take some questions now. I can answer uh, something about poetry, something about annuals and perennials, anything you want to know about uh, grass carp or red horse suckers, um, proper way to, to tie on a spinner bait and how to run it during a, a winter at night, whatever you want. Uh, our first question is about poetry <laughs> uh, and it's from Ray uh, from the audience. And the question says, I love what you said about letting the poem sort of subsume or at least alter the biographical. How do you get to that point of letting the quote unquote truth go and letting the poem happen? What does that process look like of letting the poem dictate its own truth? Sometimes it just takes, you know, I, I, I told you that I, that I slip in and out of form quite often. And sometimes I'll find myself trying to adhere too closely to autobiography and um, sure, it's interesting to me, but the, the poem itself isn't fit for uh, an audience. Um, it's either too encoded or, you know, the, the kind of emotional appeal to me, I'm not sure that it would come across to the audience. So sometimes I'll throw that into form, which will force me into a more objective state. Um, sometimes I'll assume persona like I used to. Um, other times I will... Uh, I'll tighten the lens on something. So instead of, of talking about myself or talking about a conversation that I had with someone or talking about a specific event, I'll back off a little bit and close in on something that's on the periphery of the scene that I imagine. Or as I did in those two elegy um, poems, I uh, kind of cross-pollinate the two. I take the context of the poem uh, for instance, I talked about being in New York for Jake Adam York, but yet I took that from that poem and I thought that it applied better to the Lures poem that was about another friend of mine who passed on. Also, the Mayan end, you know, you remember, you may remember that it was 12, 12, 12 was supposed to be the Mayan end. That was before my friend Scott died. Uh, but I started thinking about him uh, earlier on before he died. But these are all... Um, 
Uh, these are all shifts and changes where the imagination and reality start blending together. Um, if you read uh, The Necessary Angel by Wallace Stevens, he talks about that. Also, Marianne Moore, you know, has that wonderful line where she talks about um, real toads and or real toads and imaginary gardens. And I think that we've got to remember that, that if we if we too strictly adhere, then we're writing creative nonfiction, you know, um, and we already know the beginning and the end. Uh, instead, I think that we have to surprise ourselves and uh, we have to figure out where that door is to kick out or where that mortar joint is that we have to whittle out to see outside or that, that window that we need to slightly open just to let in some breeze at the end, not necessarily a conclusion, but something that, that we are unaware of, something that hasn't happened in our own lives. And I think that that's the way that we, uh, that we write our best poems. And we come to a greater truth because we're able to talk about some things indirectly that we may not be able to bear directly. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is from Haley. Uh, the question is, or maybe it's Hallie. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Uh, the question is, what was your process for ordering this collection and how many poems did you leave out from your original consideration? Oh gosh, I probably left out 15 or 20 poems initially. Um, I kind of piled everything together. And what I, I do, I, I see a lot of people doing this. They either hang them on walls or they put them on the floor and they take a look at them. I generally put them on the floor and I like to look at the shapes of the poems. So it doesn't even necessarily have to do with the content yet when I'm first looking at them, but I'm looking at the shapes of them. I have quite a few, um, I have quite a few couplets uh, in, in this collection, poems comprised of couplets. I have quite a few um, um, uh, poems in form, so they're shorter forms. So I might have a, you know, six or seven sonnets. So I would look at those and uh, I, would, I would just kind of arrange according to that, whatever was pleasing to my eye. And then I looked back over them again and I saw, um, and I started looking at the content of the poems. Um, but I didn't want it to be, uh, I didn't want it to be content related to any either or uh, on a linear trajectory of time. So then I started thinking about thematic elements for the first time, which is something that's dangerous to do when you're first writing a collection or a project. You know, I hate it when people say I'm working on a project because then it seems so incredibly determined already um, or predetermined. Um, I like the idea of just getting started on something. You know, I, I, I know that my last collection was uh, all ekphrastic poems, so I knew they were going to be about paintings and about artworks. However, what surprised me was it wasn't necessarily about the artwork when I really started digging in. It was more about the social circumstances in the, in the museums. It was about, you know, social interactions. It was about the edifice itself. It was about the kind of reverence that people take and the, the kind of sterility of a, an environment like that. And how a speaker like me who's looking at art can be drawn into uh, their own subjective worlds, you know, in that reader response uh, and, and looking into their, uh, what, what they truly miss while they're gone and what they find in the, the paintings to, to find some sense of relief. Um, so yeah, after I did that, kind of figured out some thematic elements, I kept writing and I was fortunate enough to be able to go to a writing residency where I pumped out a bunch of poems. I'm a, I'm a chunk poem writer, so I'll, I'll sit down and maybe write a poem over three days, you know, or a first draft. And then I may not write for a while, um, but this was my first residency I'd ever been to. And I, I was, I was uh, scared shitless on the first couple of days because nothing was happening. I went into that cave and then I wrote that first draft of that poem I'd been struggling with and wrangling with for 20 something years. And then everything started to open up. So almost all of those poems ended up being in this collection too. So it's this amalgam of things that I've written over time uh, and very recently. And I found myself uh, thematically just, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was in the game. Thematically, I was in the game. And, um, Many of them had something at least tertiarily to do with water or fishing. So it just kind of made sense. But yeah, don't be scared to throw out your poems. Um, my first collection that I wrote, I think the first rumination had over a hundred poems in it. And I ended up cutting out probably 50 of those poems um, and then added another 15 or, or 20 along the way. 
Thank you so much. Um, our, we actually have a lot of comments coming in that are very nice, but I'll share those with you afterward instead of just reading them to you one by one while you sit there. Um, but our next question is from Laurel. Uh, the question is, could you talk more about persona and persona poems and how that's helpful? Yeah, I mean, persona is a way to distance yourself from the event. Um, so it may be, you know, sometimes it's just an approach that you take. Um, instead of taking the third person approach, instead of taking the second person approach, you wanna take the first person approach, but you wanna assume the persona. And what a lot of people don't take into account is assume means to take the place of. So it's not just that you are adorning the clothes of something or adorning the edifice of, of someone or you know that exterior landscape, you are actually assuming them. You are taking the place of them. So in order to um, really understand maybe Ophelia, who doesn't get a whole lot of play uh, in, in Hamlet, you wanna take the, assume the persona of Ophelia, where you, you're trying to imagine the white spaces that are, are left there, trying to imagine what Ophelia would have said, or maybe it's a biblical character from the Bible who isn't given a voice, or maybe it's, I, I've had poems about I imagined Gauguin's daemon, you know, that homunculus who was always, you know, kind of pushing him toward a certain kind of art, putting napkins over people's heads and, you know, distancing people and that kind of surrealist notion of hanging someone in an armoire or uh, placing them in a closet and the psychological implications of that. Um, and then there's, you know, you can take the, the voice of multiple personae also, where you have a collective we that you imagine. Um, but I think that there, there is a wonderful distancing technique where you can, you can um, instead of having two people in a conversation, you can have one person and you can assume that voice. And if you're doing it authentically, if you're doing it with humility um, and hopefully with a bit of grace, um, that, you will, um, that, that you will take that, that voice and, and do it justice. Um, I've, I've moved a little bit away from that, but I still, assume, you know, I assume voices all the time. You know, even these voices in this poem that I, some of them are the most autobiographical that I've ever um, taken. Um, I'm still, you know, adorning other people. I'm still, that, that character isn't necessarily me. Um, and I say character, you know, I don't think that we can ever truly um, capture that voice um, if we're going to be, honest to the poem, we should be writing to the fruition of the poem and not the fruition of our autobiography. Thank you so much. That's super interesting. Um, our next question does not really have to do with poetry, but you said anything was fair game. So Jonathan is asking if you are a runner and says that he gets that vibe from you. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I, I hate running, to be honest, but um, uh, I'm one of these, uh, I like challenges. So I have a bunch of uh, guys who have talked me into putting on running shoes and wearing running shorts and putting on um, running attire and headbands and things. And we go out and uh, look real colorful and uh, breathe really hard. Um, but yeah, I find myself uh, running some. I like running through uh, in the woods more than I like running on the streets. I think streets are uh, made for cars, but I, I like to devolve back to my original state and, and run down the trails as if a large mammal's behind me. Thank you so much. Uh, to get back to poetry, we have a question from Leona. Uh, you write so many poems about grief. Do you let some time go by before you engage in this heaviness? Does it make a difference to do so? Yes, I wait a long time. I mean, I don't even attempt to write. Um, I, again, I wrote, a, I wrote the, the poem about losing my grandfather's cabin, but I didn't realize till later that that was an elegy to my father and my grandfather. Um, it was an elegy to everyone who had lived on that land since the 1830s, all of my vines relatives who were coal miners and dirt farmers and fishermen um, and ran ferries down there. Um, but I, I wasn't ready to write it. When I say that this book, um, you know, it was a book that I tried to write a long time ago. I couldn't write it because I was too close to that grief. Um, 
And later on, I've, I've had other losses, sadly. A number of my friends have died, you know, in the past seven or eight years. Um, but maybe I'm a little older and uh, more accepting. Um, I'm not as angry as I used to be. And uh, I, I try not to let my emotions take over too much. But um, yeah, the, the poem about Jake Adam York was probably three or four years. You know, I didn't finish it till three or four. Well, no, I take that back. It was within the year that I finished that one. But many of the poems about Scott and some of these poems about my father, my father died when I was 18. And I'm just now I'm able to write about them. It is kind of like the burning bush. It's uh, sometimes it's just too much to bear. Um, and we don't allow ourselves to see things clearly. And uh, we don't want to revisit and relive, um, but then we find out that reliving and uh, embracing is a celebration of their life and celebration of the time that we did have and how valuable those memories are and uh, the kind of cultural and uh, familial lineage that we continue if we do right. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is uh, from Laurel. The question is, I'd love to hear about your work with ekphrastic poetry. So much is misunderstood about this type of work. Parentheses, I'm an ekphrastic poet. Uh, at what point do you say this poem stands on its own without the artwork? Or where do you draw that line? I do that pretty quickly. I mean, I've, uh, you know, when I taught an ekphrastic workshop, a graduate ekphrastic workshop a couple of uh, semesters ago, and I taught one before that. And, you know, we would go into AVA, which is our university um, museum that has wonderful exhibits. And in that first workshop, I think that we would talk about whether um, the poem had moved away from the artwork. Maybe it was just a launching point, maybe, and, and now we don't need it at all. Even if someone looked it up, it wouldn't inform. And I'm a firm believer that the poem should be able to stand on its own regardless of whether we see the artwork or not anyway. That's something that can come in later. If you have an attribution below the title, someone can choose to go, but it should be able to stand on its own. And it shouldn't be because someone's so hyper familiar with the, the visual art that they can see it while they're reading it. I think that it, it has to stand on its own. Um, I started writing them because I started out as a, a, a visual artist when I was you know, younger. And I was a landscaper also. So I was working full time, going to school part time. And when I was introduced to writing poetry, which was just an accident when I was 25 or 26, I was in a, a class that I thought was a poetry lit class. And I was just taking classes at night, ended up being a poetry writing class. And I tried to walk out, but the professor said, give it a run, give it a run. So I wrote my first poem or I never would have written a poem. Um, so I, but I had to make some hard decisions there and I moved away from um, stretching canvas and painting and uh, started writing and I had such limited time because of work that I really immersed myself in the writing and study of poetry. It wasn't until 15, 20 years later that I decided I was going to write an ekphrastic uh, book and I'd written ekphrastic poems uh, for the, for my first book, but I didn't see them live and then I, I realized that I was kind of unhappy with those poems because I, I wasn't there live seeing the work. It was the impact of having a Pollock in front of you that's 20 foot long, you know, where you can see all of the textural elements. You can see the true color. You can actually smell if you're close enough, which I did at the Columbia Museum of Art. You can smell the cigarette smoke still in the paint. And you can just imagine him over that canvas with a cig and ashes falling out, and, you know. Um, I had to be there for the, the sensory details. Also, um, it was about my engagement with the art on its own terms, you know, instead of me having a coffee table book or looking at a 12 by 12 screen like I am now. Um, so many of the poems that I wrote uh, didn't end up really fitting into the ekphrastic collection, but I did realize that those offshoot poems um, sometimes you know, to be informed by, you know, for it to be an influence model is, is good enough, you know, that that launching off point, if it does um, inform the poem to look back at the painting, then I would leave the attribution. Otherwise, I would take that poem and I'll find something else to do with it. Um, also, taking different approaches, instead of merely looking at what's inside the frame, I learned to stretch the frame around 
you know, people who are in the museum to stretch it around the physical edifice, to stretch it around, you know, the couple who are there on their first date or the, or the docent who's speaking horribly to children and trying to teach them how to read a painting and losing their interest completely or allowing my own subjective renderings to come in also. And those were just as valuable. And I'd like to think that, you know, the artists, even though visual artists are much more um, prone to give us uh, detailed instructions on how to read their work. And poets are, um, I hope, at, at the very least skeptical, but I, I hate to tell someone how to read something. But I'd like to think that there's a part of them also who loves the idea that someone uh, someone comes in and is making all of these uh, subsidiary connections instead of how they want them to read um, their art, which is in, generally in their artist statement or on a placard. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is about all of those lovely poems that you shared about your daughter. Um, mm -hmm. Elaine from the audience asks, as Mary ages, do you think she'll give you more inspiration for future poems? Yeah, and I guarantee that this Elaine is my mother-in-law. And I got in trouble um, in an interview that I gave in South Carolina because something came up and I was and I was creating a metaphor and kind of cutting up at the end. And I was I was feeling a little lightheaded from being in that interview in a stuffy old library for a while. And I said, Yeah, that's kind of like my my mother-in-law's dusty pork chops. And I went on and on about her dusty pork chops. And she heard that. And she said, to hell if you get Sunday dinner anymore. So um, I've got to be careful with this one. Luckily, it's about my daughter, though. Um, yes, I see her. She's influencing work uh, right now that I'm writing. Um, it took me a long time to write about Mary, though. Those, those poems about her when she was very young, um, like this little piggy. Um, I, I wasn't able to write that until she was four or five years old. old. And I think it has to do um, kind of, you know, related to the question that Leona asked, you know, I, I was just too close to it. It was too bewildering at the time. You know, I was a, I was an old daddy. I was a, you know, I had one child and God, it was just, it was this amazing experience, but I had no idea what I was doing. And I was just, you know, I, I didn't know how to write about it. And I, and I, every time I would try to, it seemed so incredibly trite and you know, sentimentalized. And then I realized, shit, that's okay. It's okay to be a little sappy. It's okay to fall over in the pudding every once in a while when you're talking about your daughter. And maybe that's the way that we uh, make ourselves vulnerable too. An old stuffy objective poet like me, allowing himself to, uh, allowing his maw to open up and show you that he's got a little tapioca pudding in there. Thank you very much. Um, we have some joke questions about you lifting pounds of Slim Jims, but I don't think that we need to <laughs> worry about those today. Um, so I think we are going to call that the end of the event. Oh, well, I've had a wonderful time. Thanks for all the great questions. And I know that I have uh, people I love in the audience just by the questions. If you wouldn't have said their names, I would have known who some of them were anyway. <laughs>